So the brain has these many folds on the cerebral cortex. When you study the brain, you study it as the cerebral hemisphere, the diencephalon, which is the midbrain, and then you have the, um, the medulla. And so in between, you have a couple of structures in between there. So this would be the cerebral cortex, this would be the cerebellum, this would be the pons, and this would be the medulla. And then the spinal cord would exit below. When you look at the brain, you see these folds around. Inside is the diencephalon or the midbrain. Okay, the diencephalon and the midbrain are the same, same. When you look at this, it's kind of folded around. You see all these folds. It increases the surface area. And you have the gyri on the top, and the sulcus is like the valley. The number of gyri, number of sulcus doesn't make you smarter. Just one number one. The size of the brain doesn't matter. In this case, size doesn't matter. The size of the brain doesn't matter. So you can have a very large brain like an elephant or in a, um, a cetacean, a whale. They have large brains. They're smart, but not smarter than a human, right? And so also the ratio of the size of the brain to the body doesn't matter either. You can have this uh, certain mice and stuff. Different animals have large brains compared to the body. They're pretty smart, but not smarter than a human, right? So we get that out of the way. And um, so we have some specific landmarks. First of all, in the cranium, we had a frontal bone, right? So you have a frontal lobe. In the cranium, we have the temporal bone, you have the temporal lobe. In the cranium, we have the parietal bone, you have the parietal lobe. And in the cranium, you have the occipital bone, and you have the occipital lobe. Each one is specific for different things. If any of you have taken psychology and you learned about the prefrontal cortex, anybody hear about that? What's interesting about the prefrontal cortex? Who's the famous guy who had the bar go through his brain? Oh, God. Well, I think you're talking about the guy on the tower that shot people and he had a tumor. No, I don't think that happened. <laughs> there was, in this, I think it was the 1800s or the 1700s, yeah. there was a man who was worked for the railroad, I believe, and a railroad tie went right through the skull, through the frontal cortex, and actually went right through his prefrontal cortex. And what happened was this man was a very good employee, very, you know, on top of everything. Managing, management position type of person. After that happened, he didn't die, they took the bar out, but he could not function properly. He couldn't make proper decisions. He was always late to work, he did crazy stuff. He ended up dying at a young age on the street because he couldn't, couldn't function. So in psychology, the prefrontal cortex is said to control those other parts of your, of your brain. So the, the cortex is the higher brain of conscious thought. So when you have to make a decision on what's right and wrong, they believe that the prefrontal cortex is the area that drives those other things. So in other words, when you say to yourself, oh, maybe I shouldn't do that. Oh, I have to go to work now. The prefrontal cortex is the one that's driving that. Could that be also the same thing as executive functioning? Yeah, executive functioning, yeah, controlling everything. That's mm -hmm. the control center. And people who have schizophrenia have disconnects from that and the rest of the body. And then people with addictions tend to get a disconnect with the prefrontal cortex and the rest of the uh, brain. Because they, after they're doing it over and over again, after a while, they've so, done it so many times, it doesn't matter to them anymore. And then it creates an addiction inside, internally, with the, with the chemicals produced at specific locations. Depending on the addiction, there are specific locations in the brain that are being stimulated with neurotransmitters. So anyhow, so you have these folds. The sulci is the groove. The gyri is the top of the mountain. So you have a... Um, a pre-central, um, a central sulcus, excuse me, and that would be the largest sulcus you're looking at from the side. I would believe that this, the central sulcus, would be right here, right? And I have a pre-central gyrus, and you have a post-central gyrus of the central sulcus. The pre-central gyrus is significant. Why? Anybody know? Is it fine motor? That's motor. Pre-central gyrus is motor. Post-central gyrus is sensory. So you need to know that. Pre-central gyrus is motor, post-central gyrus is sensory. Then you have the temporal lobe, that's for auditory, and you have the occipital lobe, which is for visual. Visual. You know what's fascinating when we dream? The theory is now with, with dreams, is the reason why the dreams are so crazy to you, you have different parts of your brain for auditory, visual, and hearing, and, um, and all of these different aspects and you're putting together information you've learned for the first time and going into the recesses of your mind to try and identify different things you've learned in the past that are similar to what you're learning in the new topic. So if you learn about an elephant, let's say, 
you'll dream about a tree trunk, let's say, and a snake, and a trombone, or whatever, and that would be part of yourself putting those things together. And people with schizophrenia do not dream well because they don't sleep well, and they disconnect, and they start having these awake type of dreams, in a sense, and they're disconnecting. Nothing is connecting in their body. So you need to sleep to connect stuff, and that's why you <laughs> so now going down the center of the cerebral is the cerebral hemispheres. You have a right and a left brain. Everybody talks about the right brain and the left brain. Down the center is the longitudinal fissure. Okay? And if you open it up a little bit, you look inside, you can see it's connected by a white fiber. If this was a real brain, it would tear open a little bit and you see a white core in the center going across the center of the brain. And this white core here, this is the, what is that? Corpus callosum, which connects the left to the right. It's white myelinated fibers connecting right side to the left side of the brain. So there's your corpus callosum. All right? That connects the right and left side of the brain. Okay? And now let's open it up looking at it from the side view. We have some nice views here. So this is your corpus callosum connecting the right and left side of the brain. And then here, this would be your lateral ventricle. Now you have the ventricles of the brain are a space lined with a choroid plexus at the top which produces the fluid. Remember the cerebral spinal fluid is produced by those ependymal cells? It's actually taking the blood from the venous supply and taking that serum and using some of it to make the CSF. So you have on each side of your brain the ventricles of the brain. So this is a lateral ventricle and the other side you see the other lateral ventricle on either side. So just in the front here, below the corpus callosum, is the lateral ventricle. This red right here, this right here, that is your choroid plexus that's producing the CSF right there. And then this whole area here is the thalamus. This would be the thalamic connection from one side to the other. That connects the, th the one side of the thalamus to the other side right there. So, but this is the thalamus right here. The thalamus is a major connecting uh, center of the brain, it's right in the center of the brain, and it connects the higher to the lower brain. So information going up and information going back down is processed in that area. And then just below the thalamus you have this area called the hypothalamus. It kind of looks like a triangular area almost. That's your hypothalamus. Anybody remember what the hypothalamus does? And the, it's controlling the autonomic nervous system and it controls the endocrine system. You know, the endocrine system you'll learn next semester, we talk about the pituitary gland. We use, somebody made this because we always lose the pituitary glands. This is actually from the original model. But this is what the pituitary gland would be coming down, kind of like a grape coming off the stalk of a grape, which would be the infundibulum. This is the pituitary gland. This is the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus controls the pituitary, and the pituitary controls the endocrine system. Really. The hypothalamus is controlling the endocrine system. The pituitary is actually under the direct control of the hypothalamus. You have hormones that tell the pituitary gland what to release, and then the pituitary tells the other glands what to release in your body. Right? So now this is, you're going to learn this next semester, but the pituitary gland is also called the hyp hypophysis, right? Remember you learned the hypophyseal fossa? It's the pituitary fossa, right? And you have two parts of the pituitary gland. You have an anterior and a posterior. The anterior is called the adeno, A-D-E-N-O, adenohypophysis. And that prefix, adeno, is telling you that it's glandular. If you have a tumor and it's an adenocarcinoma, it's a carcinoma or a tumor made up of glandular tissue. The back of the pituitary, the posterior pituitary gland, is called the neurohypophysis which has all nerve fibers. So that, that's a very significant difference between the pituitary gland, that the actual posterior pituitary gland, or posterior hypothesis, or another name of it is the neurohypothesis, is actually an extension of the hypothalamus. So really half of the pituitary gland is literally just an extension of the hypothalamus fibers, nerve fibers. People don't realize that. Okay, so this is your hypothalamus, very important. It controls the autonomic nervous system and controls the endocrine system. You have an anterior pituitary and a posterior pituitary. The anterior is called the adenohypothesis. The posterior is called the neurohypothesis. You're going to thank me next semester when you take AMP2.
because you already got a little pre preempt on that. So I won't ask anterior or posterior pituitary information. I just wanted to show you how important the posterior pituitary is, how it connects to the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus tells the pituitary what to do. Um, then what we have here, you have these mammillary bodies right next to the pituitary. If you notice, you look underneath here, this, let's look at it this way for a second. This is familiar to you guys because we looked at the cranium and we went down and named the cranial nerves already. So here, this is the olfactory bulb or the olfactory nerves right coming here. And here's the optic nerves with the optic chiasma crisscrossing. And right in the center was that cella tersica, right? And here's the pituitary or hypothesis gland. And then the mammillary bodies are right underneath it. See it there? What do they do? They say that it's part of the pituitary gland. It actually has nuclei in there, part of the, um, of the uh, hypothesis, I mean the, uh, the um, hypothalamus, and it actually, they say it actually functions as part of the pituitary gland. That's what they say. And then you have something else that's very unique. You can't see it from this view. We're going to come back to this view. Let's go back to the lateral view. And what you see here, coming back, all the way back, number 23, that's your pineal gland. Pineal gland is fascinating to me. When I was in undergrad here in Nassau, actually in this classroom, I think, is where I took the course. No, it was in the bio department. Took a course on comparative anatomy, which is studying all the different species. And we had to dissect a lamprey eel. And the lamprey eel is a deep water fish. It doesn't have eyes. It just has a covering over the eyes. The eyes don't function. It's actually covered with skin. But on the top of his head is a lens that would look like an eye would be underneath it, but guess what's right underneath that? The pineal gland. So that it can receive whatever sunlight's at the deepest, darkest, darkest depths of the water. It's so dark there, how dark is it? You can't see anything, but there is still a little bit of light, even in that dark place, and then it slips through the lens of the, um, the top of this, this uh, area of this, of this fish, and the pineal gland's under there. So the pineal gland functions in our sleep-wake cycle and our circadian rhythm. And it's dependent upon sunlight. If you don't get proper sunlight in the daytime, you won't sleep well at night. And this is why people who are shift workers, they have an effect. They have an effect of uh, sleep effect. They can't sleep right. They can't function right. And after a while, it really affects their whole body. Their circadian rhythm goes off. Usually women who are on that sleep, uh, that, um, those night shifts, they, it throws off their cycles as well because it's in function with your hormones and everything in your body. And that's taking light through your eyes. You know, if you notice your eyes have a pigment, right? The color of your eyes and the pupil of your eyes is pure melanin. And the color of your eyes is just different mixtures of melanin. Melanin has different shades of colors. So some people have less melanin, some people have more. The more melanin, the darker the eyes, right? And so that's actually taking in the light and absorbing it. It's passing through and it gets to the pineal gland as an effect on it. It's amazing, right? This is why sunglasses with UV rays are not good for you, for your sleep cycle. You know, the cars we have have UV um, blockage too. So you want some sun to penetrate your eyes. You want to sit there and stare at the light, but you want sun to penetrate your eyes. And if you've ever been at a beach, for three hours in the daytime, even if you're not totally in the sun, you're out there looking at the sun, that night, you come home, you sleep really well as soon as it gets dark, right? Because your body produces more melatonin because it was stimulated by light all day. And if you don't shut the lights off, it's hard to kick in the melatonin production. If you're watching TV or on the computer screen, you won't kick in melatonin production that well. Can I just ask you a quick question? Um, I read somewhere that as people age, they have No, I never heard of that, but it, okay. it makes sense, you know, it starts to degenerate, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. The body degenerates. Um, I just read about a really interesting substance. You ever buy those five-hour energy drinks? Mm -hmm. And you look at the label? Look up all the different things on the label. It's fascinating. The last thing on the list is a specific um, chemical that helps your circulation in your brain. It helps Alzheimer's, actually. Yeah. It's a, and it's pretty cool. So, I mean, it's naturally found in, in foods, too. It's like the, um, the uh, bitter taste of an uncooked uh, or slightly raw, um, I think it was 
like uh, lemon or whatever, and it's got that.